Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Excellent. Did you know that you can find us on every social media platform? Murder Dictionary Podcast. Just look for us. We're everywhere. You can be in our group. You can find out about our new letters, what's coming up, what we're up to. We want to know what you're up to. And we've got memes. We've got breaking news stories. Lots of There's news a ton stories. of stuff. So definitely come over and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Always feel free to leave us a five-star review on iTunes as well. Yeah, if you're enjoying the show, definitely rate, review, and subscribe. We would really appreciate that. We'd love that. Yeah. If you also want to further support the show, you can be on our Patreon where we have bonus episodes. So if you want to check that out, it's patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast. And on that note, we want to say thank you to a few new patrons on our Patreon. So thank you to Michelle, Jennifer, and Ellen. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. We appreciate you. Definitely check out our bonuses on our Patreon. This week, we are still on jailhouse murders for letter J, and we're going to cover a riot that happened um, in the New Mexico State Penitentiary. Why can I never stay, say the word penitentiary? Am I the only person penitentiary? No, I, that's it, right? <laughs> yes. I think there's a lot of people, Every though, time I fuck it up, though. Yeah, it, it's usually spelled wrong, or spelled, said wrong. And the funny thing is, is you're probably one of the few people that know how often I mispronounce things because I always edit it out, right? <laughs> but this one, it's like, I know I'm going to mess it up throughout the show. Penitentiary. 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 <laughs> Either well, I think I mean we know what you mean. Doesn't everybody have a like a mental block against a couple words? Like anonymous is a hard one for people, you know. I my my thing always, and I did it earlier talking to you. Even Boston Strangler, Hillside Strangler, completely I cannot. Dip, it's all it, one's Hill Boston doesn't matter. We'll never know for sure what I'm talking about. Oh man, yeah, my pronunciation is um. Pretty garbage sometimes. Thankfully, we record these and I can just cut it out. It's a good thing we have a podcast. <laughs> so, yes, we are covering the New Mexico State Penitentiary. Every time I'm going to do it, every fucking time. I don't even hear it when you say, like, it's funny. You, you're so um, caught up, right? I, I'm over here just like, I know what she means. Damn you're it, already continue. thinking about what you're going to scream. Probably, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying not to yell today because, remember, my new nickname is shouty <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we are going to cover a riot so like we've talked about in the beginning of doing new letters we always try and come at it from a few different angles show a few different kinds of cases so we've already spoken about um just a single inmate on inmate crime when we talked about uh christopher scarver killing jeffrey dahmer this time it's going to be a huge just full prison takeover where a ton of violence happened. And um, now we get to explore kind of the corruption aspect and some of the things that happen within, you know, jails and prisons that cause this sort of violence, you know? Especially so, before it was focused on rehabilitation. Exactly. Yeah, there's a bigger dialogue on mental health now and there's some changes, although it happened slowly, but definitely this was back in what people called like quote the good old days when people like things were shitty but yeah, for some reason they always call it the good old days right this is good for <laughs> so the penitentiary in new mexico was built in 1956 to replace the former pen which was destroyed in a 1953 riot not a good sign that's a bad foot to start off on, it's right? It's like rebuilding from a Malibu mudslide fire. We'll rebuild just to see it go again. That's in a, a year. perfect example. Yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, these mudslides happen all the time and they still be build those like cantilevered houses on top of them, knowing that in 10 years your house is going to be gone. We'll just put in an extra pile on. And that's exactly what they're doing. It's just yep. like, well, we'll make the walls like one inch thicker. That's never going to happen again. No more riots after now. So local officials at the time that this was built were so proud of the facility that before it was even filled with inmates, they organized this big grand opening style party where the public could actually tour the facility. It was a huge local event where everyone went through and saw the cells and everything. 
um, saw the layout. I can't even imagine going to tour a local prison, right? Also, I noticed Governor John Sims allocates $8 million to build the prison, which he says is supposed to be among the most advanced correctional institutions in the world. Yeah, so of it course was he wants everyone to come look at it. The crown jewel of the justice system. Like, here's the new prison. Yeah. For 1956, $8 million, it better be the crown jewel. That's the thing. I should have done the conversion of how much that is. But yeah, I would assume it's about double, right? That's a lot of money to spend on this new facility. Yeah, it is. So, of course, they were super proud of it, wanted the public to tour it. And it's actually, um, my family's kind of from this area, right? It's in the Albuquerque area, between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. So right? you fly into Albuquerque? Right. Run a car? Go to the prison, Got hit it. the grand opening. Okay. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> so one of the things to me that's important to point out, the attorney general's report on the riot is easily accessible online. So you can actually see a map of how the prison is laid out. And it's one of the reasons why it was so easy to spread a riot through this facility, because it's one square building in the middle which contains like a cafeteria, a gym, a library, various offices and whatnot. And then through the entire middle of the square building, there runs this main, what they call a corridor, a hallway, that continues on either side of the square building. And that's where the cell blocks are. And then so basically, the central hallway connects every cell block on the north and south sides to the main square building. So, of course, you can see how this would be dangerous. If you can access that hallway, you can get anywhere within the facility. Quickly, too. You can get there quickly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I was like, Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Look, yeah, you can I thought you were fast. interjecting a side note. Like, no. quickly, I have something to say. No. Announcement. No, yeah, you can just go to one end of the hallway and run all the way through the prison in, you know, X amount of seconds, which is when I see, you know, certain facilities that have basically an outdoor kind of middle area and each cell block is isolated. That's the reason they do that for security because you can't access one main route that gives you freedom to go to anywhere in the prison. Yes. And quickly, side note, 8 million in 1956 today, $74,994,925.37. Shut up. That's a whole lot of money. $75 million prison today. Wow. For some reason, I thought it was closer to just double. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So yeah, they're proud. So proud of this terrible design with the hallway. Right? <laughs> the individual cells themselves were about nine by six feet. And, of course, it's built in the 50s. The construction was not that great. So there was no insulation and minimal ventilation. It's unclear to me whether all of that was because of the period of time that it was built or if it was a way to just kind of cut corners because they didn't really think that inmates deserved the kind of comforts that a normal 1950s house would get. Yeah, it just seemed like it wasn't a priority to them. And it could have been a little bit of both. Yeah. Just the era and the kind of construction they were doing, plus the fact that they weren't going to go above and beyond for prisoners, I think. Yeah, they can cut corners here and then spend more on the grounds or something ridiculous. Right, right? making it look good from the outside. Yeah. Or the grand opening party. Or the warden's office. Exactly. So you can have a nice chair. <laughs> so the cells, because of this, would be dangerously, ridiculously hot in the summer. And then when it got to be winter, they were unbearably cold. I mean, yeah, it's New Mexico desert. Right. It's Which, hot or it's cold. Exactly. The temperature is a huge disparity in the winter and summer. In the late 60s, many of the inmates dedicated themselves to the facility's various educational programs. So although maybe the buildings weren't built so well, they did focus on putting money into different programs for the inmates to get involved in. That's more important. <laughs> I mean... Because they're, it'll improve their time there. Yeah, all of it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I would like more, just to not be having temperature issues and be uncomfortable in my cell or 
have something to keep me busy during the day. If you're busy, you're not in that hot, cold cell. Theoretically, you're in like some other part where if there's a other person, they're going to demand air conditioner, right? Yeah, Theoretically, maybe, maybe event or In thing. the offices. There I am. That's exactly where I, that's where I am. <laughs> so I personally, I'm signing up for every class. Yeah. Knowledge is power. <laughs> The penitentiary of New Mexico had GED programs, they had adult education tracks, and a college prep course. And inmates were selected for these programs based on their conduct. So it really benefited them to stay out of trouble, especially since once you completed one of these education programs, it often influenced the parole board. You got certain decisions that were influenced by your education. So if you were doing well, staying out of trouble, getting your GED, they might be more likely to give you early parole. It was very common. I mean, this is the way to go. Right. It keeps you on your best behavior. It gives you a goal so that, you know, you can work hard and just keep your nose down and not have any disciplinary action. Time goes by way faster when you're busy and have something to do. Oh, yeah. By the early 70s, inmate drug use had skyrocketed, and many groups were trafficking narcotics. With the influx of drugs began the reliance on staff corruption to help the inmates get the product into the facility. It wasn't exactly clear from what I understand who was bringing the drugs in. It could have been guards. It could have been the people that were running these education programs. We don't really know. All of them. Yeah. It's the all thing of those is, things is, you just said. <laughs> there's got to be at least one person in all of those groups that's like, yeah, I need a little extra money. I don't really make that much. Even though some of the COs were corrupt, the inmates who were dealing were often on their best behavior because they didn't want to get caught. So in some ways, the drugs actually helped maintain a bit of peace and order. And I mean... The first instinct is to be like, that's not possible, right? No, I, it makes perfect sense. But it kind of does. So yeah, if you know that you've got a whole stash, you're going to protect that. You're going to want to stay out of trouble, not get caught for anything. You're not going to get in any fights because you don't want to call attention to yourself. You don't want to be on the guard's radar. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Just lay low. Right. From 1970 to 1975, less than 5% of the inmate population was in solitary confinement, and there were only three escape attempts. Although the early 70s were kind of uneventful, from 1975 to 1980, the conditions deteriorated and there were 18 escape attempts and 36 successful escapes. That's a big difference to go from three to, you know, almost 40 people escaping full on getting out and then like 20 trying. That's a lot. Like something changed big time. Exactly. Something changed. Something broke. exactly what those statistics mean. Like obviously the conditions were worse. The inmates were really unhappy in the facility. They wanted to get out. And obviously everybody that's in jail doesn't want to be in jail, right? But there's a difference between pl- like that feeling and plotting a whole entire escape attempt. And there were so many people that were doing it once the late 70s hit because the conditions were so bad. The treatment from the COs was bad. You know, all of these things, they were actively plotting to get out. So this makes it clear that basically in the mid 70s, there was a shift and it becomes apparent that there were many issues within the prison when these statistics changed from 1975 to 1980. Around this time where things became clearly different and inmates were unhappy, the attorney general, Tony Anaya, accused the staff of corruption which led to the removal of both the warden, Felix Rodriguez, and the deputy warden, Horatio Herrera. There was a report that was prepared and sent to the governor. The attorney general stated that, quote, the free flow of contraband drugs into the penitentiary is at an alarming level. So soon after, 
four additional high level staff members were relieved of their duties. There's so, there's our right. There's our crack. It was clear that either they were the ones that were bringing it in or they turned the other way. And obviously those two warden deputy, they know. And it's systemic. It comes from the top. You got to start there and then just trickle down. And they're getting information from inmates, from other people, dissenters in the group, right? I mean, time to clean it up. Yeah. So they brought in a new warden. And the new warden and his team really cracked down hard on the inmates. They did more searches. They gave out less privileges. The culture had completely changed. They were very strict. They even did away with many of the education programs that the inmates could earn for good behavior. For fear, of course, like I said, that the outside staff running these programs possibly could be bringing in drugs too. One of the last incentives for good behavior was to earn a transfer to a medium security prison, but eventually a halt was put on the transfers as well. So at this point, with all those things gone, you can see there's really no incentive to be on good behavior at this point. It's weird to me, too, that they just stop transferring people. Like, is it because you're worried they're going to talk? If they right, go somewhere maybe. else, like, why would you not allow more transfers? The goal here, the idea is get them out, get them in, keep them, get them out. So it's just strange to me. There's something, something else there. There was actually, and I wish that I remember the details, but there was a high profile case that actually halted transfers throughout the state. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember if it was like something happened during like on a bus for a transfer. I don't remember what it was, but they basically decided to keep the inmates where they are and not move them around to different facilities. Got it. Yeah. This new regime that was coming in clearly believed that cracking down and being more strict was restoring order to the prison and making the facility safer. But in reality... They had removed any motivation to do well and keep peace. The inmates really no longer needed to stay out of trouble to avoid being caught for drug trafficking and had no possibility of earning transfers or education or parole advantages for good behavior. What's the point? Right. There's no, there's no future. There's nothing for you. That was the last little bit of hope. And it's, yeah. I'm sure, just so hard to maintain hope when you're behind bars. They needed those programs and those perks and those things to earn in order to stay on a positive track and, and keep moving forward Yeah, and feel hopeful. So, of course, without these things, you're going to disintegrate to where you're grasping for control and power and respect in more violent ways. So a lot of these inmates that were previously like, okay, I'm going to get my GED, maybe the parole board would notice. Instead, they're scrambling to maybe fight with more inmates or assert their dominance through violence, you know? Yeah, basically, you know, pardon me, but it's time to fuck shit up. Right. And assert myself now. They were really achieving the opposite of what they had planned on doing. They were like, yeah, yeah. if we're more strict, they're going to listen to us. Well, no, they're going to be more rebellious. They're going to fight with each other because they have no reason not to. Hey, parents listening, have you ever cracked down on your teen children? <laughs> Tell right? us how that goes. Take the door off the hinges and stuff. Maybe <laughs> that'll keep them from doing so. Oh, fuck no. They're going to their friends' houses now. See if you can find them. Yeah. And that's a great point. I mean, that really is how Breeds it works. rebellion. Come on. Absolutely. Yeah, so often when you're just more controlling and strict, people are going to go against that. They're going to fight even harder. If you trust a little, you know, just give them that little and just see how it goes, right? And it's like, that's what they had been doing. But the drugs is what, like, honestly, it seems like it was a misguided attempt to clean that up. But that was kind of what was holding it together. Yeah. Which, you know, it yeah. is what it is. I can totally understand not wanting to have the drugs in there. Of course, there's, you know, a little bit of a greater risk of infighting or different dealers or different groups kind of trying to compete for control, overdoses. Yeah, it's dangerous. But you could also get rid of those and crack down, maybe do the searches, 
but not take away the education programs, you know? Yeah, I don't know why they're punished, everybody, by taking away education. I mean, knowledge is power. Come on. Yeah, and especially when they're given the opportunity to feel good about themselves by achieving something. That's it right there. They don't want to feel good about themselves. Yeah, it, it's easier to just like keep to break them beat someone. down. Yeah. And that's, you know, I feel like what happened around 1975 with the transition of the drugs, they started treating them more like animals. Just keep them in their cages, feed them minimally, like, you know, yeah. give them less privileges. Let's just keep them behind bars instead of treating them like human beings that need to feel good about themselves, that need to have goals to achieve, that need to have hope. You know, they took away all those human emotional motivators, you know, send them to the dog pound. Really? It's it's really deplorable. But it was a huge change. And it happened in 1975. So now they have no reason to do well anymore. So after this happened, and they're just kind of trudging along for a few months, trying to like, you know, operate under the new regime or whatnot. They, of course, were miserable and they started planning on things to do to improve their conditions. So the inmates organized a work strike in June 1976. And about 70 percent of the inmates actually participated to protest the actions of the new guard. That's enough people to get attention. It's a ton of people. Should be. We're talking about a facility that the population that it's supposed to house is 950 people. So you're talking about... That's you seven know, out of 10. Right. You're talking about <laughs> almost 700 people. Yeah. You know, and that's, it should get the attention of someone. It should make legislators pay attention. It should spark change. And I think they were hoping to do that and do it nonviolently by just saying, hey, I'm going on a work strike. Let's, you know, improve the conditions here. The strike organizers wrote out a list of complaints and demands which detailed what the awful conditions in the prison were. They were working for pennies a day under an oppressive staff leadership, eating rotten food, while living in rodent and bug infested cells without working toilets. I, I, I have no words. Again, they were literally treating them like animals. You can tell me all these things, all these things. And then the no working toilets is where I'm just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, oh man. I had the same reaction. There's so many things that are awful. And I just, you know, the food and the infestation. And then when you get to the, numerous problems that go into detail in many of these reports about oh, yeah. the toilets. It really, it's heartbreaking that they were living in these disgusting conditions. And the bugs, and then the not working toilet breeds more bugs. Exactly. It's, just, it's cyclical. And then the yes. food is making you sick, which is in turn making causing you. toilet issues. I mean, it's yeah. just a whole cycle that keeps going over and over. So the problem was that at this time, because public perception had been so damaged by the corruption allegations, the new warden, he really felt like he had to appear as strict as possible and heavy handed. And so he could not negotiate with the strikers. So even though maybe five years earlier or five years later, there could have been more of a possibility that he would be like, OK, I can concede to some of these things, improve your conditions, but I'm not going to budge on this point or whatnot. With this current climate of having very recent corruption issues taking over a huge chunk of the media where it was just front page, he knew that he couldn't budge. There was no way for him to give up any of these demands. So instead, he ordered that the prison be locked down. And in response, the inmates completely trashed their dorms and cell blocks. So instead of going into any negotiations at all or sparking any change, they ended the work strike by violently just filling the facility with tear gas while staff members in riot gear beat the inmates into submission. That's awful. It Just was tear gas. Oh my God. Unbelievable. One of the most horrific parts that the inmates complained about was that as order was being restored, they were forced to strip naked and get interrogated in groups. 
because the staff was hoping that they could find out who the leader of the strike was. That's all this is, is just like, we're pissed off. Someone let us strike. We want to make an example out of this guy. Exactly. That's all this is. So, of course, in most inmate cultures, people don't want to be a snitch. And especially if you're interrogating them in groups, people were refusing to talk. And you can't blame them because their life would probably be at jeopardy if they did say who the person was or talk about any strike leadership at all. So when they weren't getting any information, the naked inmates were forced to walk back through the gym where corrections officers were waiting to beat them with axe handles. It was a horrifically violent end to what they had hoped would get some change. They were really hopeful at the beginning, and it ended really badly. Yeah, this is a sign of things to come, too. Yes, absolutely. After the strike, tensions between staff and inmates were at an all-time high, of course, after what had happened, just being beat down and all the violence, nobody was getting along. So the leadership began relying more heavily on coercion and violence to keep order in the prison. Less inmates were voluntarily giving information to the staff because they no longer trusted them, if they trusted them at all before. This had definitely broken it. And, like we said, they also had no positive incentives to cooperate either. Yeah, why? Why would you? How am I going to help this asshole? Please. Yeah, I'm not going to really give information to this person that just beat me with an axe. He told me if I was hungry, I should eat a cockroach. Right. And then he hit me with an axe handle, and I was naked. And now I'm full of tear gas. Let me tell you what's going on. Gladly. Sure. Let me help you. Yeah, right. (laughs) Hell no, I'm not helping you. Just over and over again, it doesn't make sense to me how the leadership staff expected that this would get them positive results, that anybody would want to cooperate with them. I I just don't understand how they thought that was going to work out for them. But of course, the supervising officers who weren't on the front lines were just constantly pushing their staff to find informants. So when that happens, the guards and COs are getting a little bit desperate and they started using very unethical tactics to get information from inmates. The main thing that they did was to make threats to label an inmate a snitch in front of other prisoners if they refused to comply. It's a death sentence. Exactly. So they knew that if they just got in someone's ear and said, hey, you better tell me what's going on or else I'm going to tell everyone you're a snitch, their life was over and they had to give up information. They were forced to. But then also you run this where, you know, you're, you're coercing the person with fear. So then anything they tell you, I don't believe any of this shit. Like, right. you know, because they're just going to say something so they can be like, okay, don't call me a snitch. This is what's going on. Mm-hmm. But then they're they're still a snitch, but just not out and about, right? But I don't believe anything you say. Yes, this would probably yield very desperate and inaccurate information. But they're not looking for real facts. They're just looking for things to toss cells and fuck people up. Exactly. That's all this is. It's just fear mongering. And it doesn't matter to them if it's real or not, because as long as they have, you know, five little tidbits of information to bring back to the leadership team and say, hey, we've been working on this, whether it's accurate or not, we've got this information, then it looks like they're doing their job because that was the priority. If it's like this, you just find someone who you know isn't a problem and you just go lie and say, hey, Tony told me this. And then they're going to kill Tony and you have no remorse and you don't feel bad and you get your check on your board and whatever. I mean, this is really, there's a lot of options for fucked up shit to happen here. Exactly. And then you know that inmates can target people that they don't like, yes. right? You know, if you have a problem with a certain person, then you could just say, hey, go search this cell and their shit is fucked up. But it doesn't matter to you because you didn't like them to begin with, you know, or the other thing that's really scary about prisons to me is you can pick on the one person that's most vulnerable. So now I think the possibility of having a bunch of people saying something negative about a mentally ill person, you know, and then they go search them five days a week or whatnot, 
you're causing a lot more chaos for this person that was already unstable or at risk or vulnerable to begin with. Yeah. You know, but it's easy for these inmates that are being threatened to point the finger at someone that's vulnerable. Yeah, definitely. So it just adds a lot of volatility to the whole institution. So the other thing that they would do is not just threaten verbally and say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call you a snitch. They would also move inmates to cell block four where snitches were known to be in protective custody. So they didn't even really have to say anything at all. They could move them to cell block four, put them there for a week or a month, and then bring them back to Gen Pop where everybody was like, this person went to four, they're a snitch. Now he's got a target on his back. So under this kind of leadership, of course, the inmates struggled to maintain any safety and power. So really their best chance at avoiding being attacked was to get a reputation for violence that made other inmates fear them. That's all you, that's all left. Yeah. So now all of these positive incentives for education or transfers or early parole were gone the only way for you to stay safe and powerful behind bars is to hurt people, to really cause a lot of damage so that nobody would fuck with you. So they achieved exactly the opposite of what the warden's goal was. The COs would also use the tactic of threatening to put people in the hole and use solitary confinement. So this statistic skyrocketed from, like I said earlier, 5% in the early 70s over 20% by the late 70s. That's a lot. That's huge. And I mean, we know there's so many studies and, and awful information about what being in solitary confinement does to the brain and to your well-being. And they were just arbitrarily putting people in here on punishment. And nobody looks at this and says, what why do we have, tw- you know, 20 percent of these people in there now all of a sudden? That's weird because like less than 10 years ago, we didn't have that many. What's going on? Nobody does that. Nobody sits back and is like cause and effect here. Right. At any point. And there's no hope to change it because they were trying to get that done with the work strike. Right. By yeah. saying, hey, you're using solitary too much. The food, the toilets, all these things are not OK. And now they have no hope of improving that by nonviolent means because it's just been shown to them that when they try and just organize a peaceful protest, one, nothing changes, two, you're going to beat me brutally, you know? It's, it's awful. So also during this time, the staff turnover doubled while they were taking this more rigid approach. And the prison even went through four wardens in only a few short years. It was like, I think a max of three years, they went through four wardens. So that's going to also cultivate this environment of constant, I don't, like, what? uh, I can't, sorry, there's a word, looking at you, pointing at you right now. We're pointing at each other. And just not, not trusting you. There's no trust that can be built in that period of time. It's such a short time. So it's like every day you've got these new COs that are trying to be badasses themselves and like assert themselves and you're not going to mess with me. So then it's like you've got a stranger telling you what's up, you got to go to the hole, do this, a warden that's only been here for a week. You've been here longer than the staff and you've seen the changes. So, I mean, no, you tell me to do something, I'm going to show you my ass right now. Like, that's my response is like, F you. Because I know better than you and I've seen the difference. So yeah, I would, if I was in there, I would, I, I couldn't, you couldn't keep me inside. Absolutely. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, if you can't cultivate trust by having a long term relationship, because the turnover is so heavy, you don't know the warden, there's a new CEO every month, then you really aren't able to say, hey, I know this person, I know how they operate, I trust them, I'm willing to give them information or earn privileges from them. So there's no reason for you to not be lashing out because you don't know these people. If you know them and you know they have families or, you know, or they've been nice to you, then there's opportunity for you to treat them better. But if you're basically the inmate, which they're looking at as an animal, you don't know this person, you're going to behave violently towards them because it doesn't matter. They're not human to you, just like you're not human to them. It just created an awful, awful environment full of tension. 
there was just consistent tension between the COs and fighting with inmates while they were also receiving conflicting direction from their supervisors. Well, yeah, because every warden that comes in has a new idea for how he wants to run this place. That last guy, he didn't know how what he was doing. That's why he's not here now. I am. So let me instill my rules and my new policies, right? And it's like, just let me do my job. The guards had no incentive to do well. You know, they had no incentive to not fight with the inmates because the wardens don't even know them well enough to maybe give them promotions or treat them well. You know, it's a brand new person. Not only that, but just imagine you're working in your office and every three days they're like, we got another HR meeting for you because we got all these new policies and this person's here now and they want to do it a little differently. Oh my God, I would want to quit every day. Right. It's like the office, another meeting, maybe in the conference room. It's like, what the hell is this one about? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh my God, every you just day. just pray that they bring in a TV. <laughs> you just pray to God that it's, you know, video day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a terrible environment for both sides, you know? Like, it's easy to place blame, but I'm the type of person that's like, well, I don't believe that all the corrections officers were 100% ethical in this situation. But at the same time, there were a lot of them that were just trying to do their best yeah. under terrible supervision and constant turnover, probably picking up extra shift because other COs are leaving so much, maybe overworked, underpaid. Like, we don't know. I'm assuming that all those things were a factor. So, of course, when the inmates are being shitty to you, you have less patience and tolerance in your shitty back, even if you started off as a good ethical guard. And then you've got the bad apples that are already do that. You know, it was a terrible time in this prison. The late 70s, it was just rampant tension and violence. And the correction officers that did stay became extremely resentful and they really no longer cared about following procedure which would be a huge issue. It became really commonplace for the staff to leave doors open and gates ajar. And because they no longer cared about following the rules and sticking to their typical procedures for safety. Okay. The whole point of prison is a closed gate and a locked door. So the hell's going on? Yeah, these are basics. <laughs> like you're fired. <laughs> Right, but Big you hear <laughs> it from staff and inmates. They were saying doors and gates were just left open. And, are, and if you're an inmate, you're like, are they testing me? Right. If I walk through this door, are they just going to break my neck and shoot me, hit me with an axe handle on the other side of the door? Or am I the lucky guy that just escaped and they let me walk out of New Mexico's prison? Yeah, absolutely. With you're the state totally of it, right. like, who knows? They might just be like, yeah, all right, he got out, whatever. We don't care. My job isn't on the line anymore. Yeah. Right? Like, it's just apathy. It is complete apathy. And like I had talked about in the beginning of the episode, one of the reasons that I did want to point out the layout of this facility was because now when you're hearing that doors and gates are open, if one wrong gate or door has access to the main hallway corridor that runs down the middle, they can literally have access to the entire prison. Oh, yeah. So well, cell blocks could be murdered. Right. This is why I was pointing it out in the beginning. It may have seemed a little random, but it was to say that once these gates are open, if you get into them, you can get anywhere in the facility. So while this was going on and the turnover was heavy and these guards were kind of becoming apathetic and really having a lot of issues with their job, some of them began lashing out at the inmates. A lot of inmates complained that the guards were psychologically terrorizing them by using their loved ones as pawns. The COs would basically tell inmates that they had looked up their contact info in the prisoner files and had begun either dating or sleeping with their wives or girlfriends. It became a very regular occurrence for them to plant the seed that their significant other was cheating on them with a CO. And you're already just all over the place in your brain. So now it's like, I'm in here. And then no matter what she says, when you get out, you just, you don't know. Right. 
there's always that thing in the back of your head, that little bit of doubt. And like you and I had talked about, we don't know if the guards were actually going to these women's houses. I assume that at least like there's that bad apple that did it at least once that this was true. But once you know that this is going to hurt an inmate, There's, I'm sure, plenty of guards that didn't even have to go to the houses. They could just say, hey, I know your address and tell them it's like, you know, 400 Main Street. I went. I know where you live. I know your girl. And of course, they're going to believe them. Yeah, you don't even have to really do it. That's what's amazing is you can just like. As long as you say. A remote sex act that you just lie about. Tell And then for the rest of his existence you know he gets out like even you've quit you're not even working there anymore but when he gets out he's gonna think that all along absolutely like i said all they have to do is plant the seed and then it's just deeply painful it's in the back of their mind forever and all you have in prison are the people on the outside Mm -hmm. so it's it's just even more painful Especially without, like we said, no education programs, no possibility of early parole or transfers, all of these things that they've taken away, the last bit of hope is like, I'm going to see my wife and we're going to be happy when I get out. Male too. Male's the only hope you have. Right. Yes. And so the other thing that they would do is the COs would get the mail for the inmates and read it in front of them and then throw it away. So they could either read it out loud if it was embarrassing or something, whatever. They could make up whatever that they wanted to say, or they could read it silently to themselves, to these inmates that they just told that they were sleeping with their girlfriends. Now the inmate can't even get a letter from that girlfriend that they truly believe is cheating on them. And then the CO just throws it away right in front of them. I mean, it could be, you know, Tommy started kindergarten, but it could also be your mother died in a fiery car wreck. Right, and we don't they'll know. they'll never know. And it's just in the trash. And they just have to invent something. And then let's say five years later they get out and they're like, oh yeah, while you were in, your aunt died. And he's going to be like, that was the letter, that was the letter, that was the letter. And it's the psychological warfare that will last for decades and years. That broke my heart. I Terrible. can't even imagine the kind of pain that you would experience hearing that about your loved one and then not being able to read those letters. To me, it's worse not knowing what's in it. Right. Them throwing it away and not reading it. Oh, my God. There's very little you could embarrass me with if you read it out loud. So I would the yeah, the not knowing is worse. Absolutely. At the end of 1977, two inmates filed a class action lawsuit against the state of New Mexico, citing similar complaints that were brought up during the work strike that was recent. Only a couple months before the huge riot. 11 inmates escaped using a hacksaw that was stolen from a construction area while a guard was sleeping. And five of the people that escaped were convicted murderers. After this escape, the staff members became even more strict and it caused a spike in tension between prisoners and staff. Well, yeah, I mean, the doors are open and they're walking into a construction site taking hacksaws. Those guys asleep. Yeah. Crack down a little more, I think, slightly. (laughs) It's going to happen. But that's the thing is there's this weird disparity between they're extra strict in certain ways, yet super lazy and lenient in others, like leaving the doors open, leaving tools out. You would think that your construction and maintenance staff would have somewhere to lock those up at the end of the day. The fact that an inmate could just easily access a hacksaw speaks to multiple people's failure, not just one sleeping guard. You know, the sleeping guard is just the one most apparent and egregious thing that really speaks volume about the entire staff, you know? So when the inmates were caught, the tower guards were fired, but there was no changes made to any of their security issues that really allowed them to steal the hacksaw and run out of the open gate. So none of the other people that had failed at their jobs were held accountable, and there were no changes. So less than a month before the riot, the bars surrounding the command center booth of the prison were replaced with glass. The higher-ups believed that the glass would increase visibility for the staff members inside, 
who had the important job of controlling access to all the different areas of the prison. Corrections officers, including the ones that worked inside the control center, were told that the glass was bulletproof. Uh oh. When the glass arrived to be installed, they discovered that it was, in fact, not bulletproof at all. Oh. Yeah. Not good. So the COs actually working the control booth immediately noticed how it, it didn't feel as secure as the previous bars had because they knew it wasn't bulletproof. Even if the inmates maybe believe that it was, doesn't matter because they could easily break it. In the months and weeks before the riot, the prison was once again becoming dangerously overcrowded. And it's hot and unventilated. <laughs> yeah, and this was actually, it was in the winter. Okay, it's cold. Yeah, and but it's still, <laughs> yeah. No, we'll get into it, trust. <laughs> it's pretty gnarly. So it was uh, designed to hold 950 inmates, like I said before. But the population at this point, was reaching almost 1,300 on many occasions throughout the late 70s when things were at an all-time low. And they're still not doing transfers. Right. So they're just collecting people. And normally you'd send them out. It doesn't really get that bad, but they're just hoarding folks. That was one of the contributing factors. They could even send them out of state, which, again, we've discussed on other things. Sending a prisoner out of state away from their family may be problematic. But if you're living in an overcrowded prison... There's a huge benefit to sending, transferring prisoners to another facility that doesn't have the overcrowding issues. In the 90 days leading up to the riot, the population had increased by over 200 prisoners. So I think it was about 1150 or 1200 at the time of the riot. Now, looking at individual areas throughout the prison, because these are broad numbers through the entire facility. So the protective custody unit, cell block four, was designed to house 90 people. But at one point, it had 212 inmates. The solitary unit, which is cell block three, was supposed to house 50 people. But it had been occupied by a whopping 200 inmates in the late 70s. That, that one is crazy. There, it's huge. It's four times the amount that is supposed to be max occupancy, right? I mean, that's insane. So at the time that the riot occurred, cell block five was closed for construction. So the inmates were moved to dorm E2 for months to come. I think it was something like four months that they were in this dorm. So this means there was one less cell block available while the population had an excess of 200 people over the facility's intended occupancy. That is crazy. And it, it, is, it is insane because we're seeing, you know, footage from holding places where they've got fucking kids in these places. And it's like, you can just, just change it. And these are adults, sure. But it's like that same just disregard for you need a bed. They'll just sleep on each other. 212 people where 50 people should be. I mean, those conditions, just the air in the room, it's just, it's just asking for trouble. And that's a perfect and point. And grown men. Dude. We've just... seen these pictures recently, yes. and that's exactly what it looked like with adults. A bunch of grown men sleeping practically on top of each other with no beds. Yeah. Awful conditions. So in dorm E2, where these displaced inmates from the construction area were moved, Conditions were especially horrifically bad. Inmates slept on the floor without blankets or pillows, and the numbers of violent incidents and sexual assault increased exponentially. Huge leaps. Inmates received a hot meal once every three days, and they were often just handed slices of bread and nothing else to eat. I got to transfer prisons. Like, no. Yeah. Every three days? And just bread in between. That's it. No vegetables, protein, drinks, nothing. And this tells you that the person at the top doesn't give a shit about humans. And that's exactly why earlier I said they treated them like animals. Yes. 
it was just the minimal amount of just keeping them alive. Disgusting. So in addition to the food problems, their access to water came only at random and arbitrary times. Each inmate had about one to two minutes to use water per day. So they had to gather the water and save it for an undetermined amount of time until the next random minute of water came on. The toilets operated in a similar manner, and they only flushed at random times. It was common for the toilets to go days without flushing, and many inmates did not have access to toilet paper on top of that. It was common. Common. Yeah. It was regular practice yeah. where you're in a cell that, again, four times the amount. So imagine there's extra people in your cell sharing the same toilet, not flushing for days. I don't want to think about that. It's so unbelievably inhumane. It breaks my heart. I can feel my voice cracking because I'm just like imagining these conditions and how horrific this is to live in. The toilet issues and other cleanliness problems, of course, resulted in severe infestation of roaches and rats, which had always been a problem. But of course, with all these cleanliness issues, it just got unbelievably bad. Ratatouille's got a place to live now, <sighs> right? They're moving in and building apartments, yeah. taking over. And I whole entire you, rat cities. I would guarantee you that correction officers would see these rats and give them bread too. And right. be doing just fine in their setup. <sighs> so on Thanksgiving 1979, the inmates were served rotten green colored turkey, which many of them, of course, took one look at and decided to just eat around the turkey and leave it on the plate. After Thanksgiving... The majority of the prisoners got food poisoning, including many of them who didn't even eat the turkey on their plate, so everything it touched had gotten them sick. Of course, needless to say, the toilet situation became even worse during this time. Imagine Thanksgiving when you have your family over. How miserable that is, right? Now. Oh, God. The inmates were becoming increasingly angry with every passing day, and there were rumors of an impending riot. Just a couple days before the riot erupted, the warden held a meeting where the upper-level staff members discussed rumors going around the prison about a possible inmate escape or possible hostage-taking. The meeting on January 31st, 1980, also covered the fact that dorm E2 consistently came up as the origin point of possible trouble. But none of this information was actually passed along to the staff working in dorm E2 on February 2nd. The lights in that dorm E2 had not been working for weeks, despite requests from staff members and the construction team knowing that they needed to be fixed. That's also insane because that E2 is where they put everyone from five and five's under construction. So now there's like double, triple the amount of people normally you would think, hey, maybe we need some light. Let's just make sure this one's decent since we've got like that many extra people. No. You would think that it would be given priority. If they had this meeting, they knew that this was rumored to be the origin point for some trouble and violence. And it has no lights at night and extra inmates, double the amount of inmates. You would get that work ticket to the top of the line, I would think. It's unbelievable to me. This is one of those points, like one of the reasons that I'm drawn to true crime, right, is looking at the solution and kind of tracing the steps back and seeing what could be done. What can we do in the future to make it better? Where did we make mistakes? And this is that one of those major points, like, all these conditions should have been better and were completely inhumane. And this is the point where they just flat out dropped the ball. They, and had, they had a meeting about it. <laughs> right. Like, and I mean, what was accomplished in this meeting? And the people in that weren't even there to, you know, it's just there's apathy with their job. That's what it is, is they're just sick of it. And they're just getting a paycheck going home, like nothing extra at all. But I would be concerned for my safety. 
I don't understand that side of it where they're just so lackadaisical about everything that like you're in the dark with a bunch of dudes. Well, that's the thing is that's what's striking about this is that there's the higher ups, the warden and whatever his leadership team is. And like I said, the information never even made it to the people that are on the front lines. So they're not the ones hearing that there's rumors of something happening. And they're the ones that are behind not bulletproof glass yeah. that you've given us to keep us safe now. They don't know what's going on at all. Poor decision making. But they're put at risk. It's so, so negligent and just... Negligent. Unbelievable. So with the lights not working, this meant that the COs had to count all the additional inmates housed there during construction and do their night checks in the dark, which was extremely risky and terrifying. And again, they had no information about possible violence that was said to be happening in E2. So on February 2nd, 1980, the inmates in E2 were drinking some pruno late into the night. And the two COs tasked with keeping the cell block secure that night were worried about their safety because everyone was clearly getting more and more drunk as the time went on. The two guards, Michael Schmidt and Ronnie Martinez, received backup from shift captain Gregoria Rybal and Lieutenant Jose Anaya so that they could complete these massive counts of all the extra people in this pitch black E2 dorm where the drunk inmates were continuing to party. They didn't know that a few of the drunk inmates had already formulated a plan that when the guards came into count, they were going to jump them. Moments after walking into E2, the COs were overpowered and taken hostage. They were stripped nude, tied up with torn sheets, and blindfolded. Other inmates soon jumped in, and it wasn't long before the COs were assaulted, tortured, and raped. And uh, now that the inmates have attacked the guards we're gonna stop because that's the end of part one we're gonna close this episode of the rock movie right now (laughs) sean connery has just come in through the tunnels underneath and ed harris is pissed yeah nicholas cage we're expecting you anytime yeah unfortunately like he's not coming is he (laughs) damn it no it's gonna be awful it's gonna be really awful he's getting the declaration of independence (laughs) i really tried to keep this shorter but all these details that were so just tore at my heartstrings i couldn't leave any of this stuff out i had to just include all the things that they were enduring the way that they were treated and the kind of conditions they were living in and it turned out that this episode was just twice as long as it it normally is so i'm I think that it's important to give this the attention that it deserves and do two episodes. No, you have to, because in order to know where we're going, you got to know where we came from. Where we came from is pretty shitty. It's bad. It's literal shit on the ground everywhere for days at a time. Wipe it up with some bread. And I wanted to start it off with like the very first part of this episode is the reason this prison even exists is because of a riot in the previous prison. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And now it's a $74 million renovation. And that's one of the things that drives me crazy is that they knew that this happened in the last prison. You would think that this would be the most secure facility in the entire state because the people behind the budgeting, the people behind the construction know that this facility only exists because of what happened at the last one. How do you not learn your lesson? We're going to find out. Right. And all this information that was coming out about, you know, the possible issues in dorm E2, I would think they would almost expect it because they put extra people in there. Why not spread it out? Why not repair the lights? Why not listen to the rumors coming out and actually make some changes in your policy and procedure? I wonder if maybe there and this is pure speculation. No one believe this is fact. Wonder if they overextended themselves in this renovation or something, or there was some sort of financial issue where things like fixing the lights, things like, I mean, unless they're just torturing the people, but maybe it's something related to 
money. Maybe there was, I mean, honestly, let's be real. There were drugs. Maybe there was like money laundering and there wasn't as much to go around or they're not paying bills or something like that. Cause there's no reason other than to torture a human, which that's possible that not to fix lights when it's your safety of your, I almost said cash owners for geocaching <laughs> correction officers for them to go in in the dark and count people. That's not safe. I mean, that it doesn't make sense why you would allow that unless there was some sort of that you could blame it on finances. Nobody argues with that. And that's so it's crazy to me because, I mean, this facility had been built in the 50s. I mean, we're talking about many years later. So cash wasn't really an issue it really truly comes down to apathy, like you said, and negligence and really not caring That's about what the inmates, seems like. you know? Um, yeah. But even then, what's crazy to me is you don't even care about your staff that either. That is what blows my mind. Because I, I have no idea what it's like to feel that way about another human being where clearly these wardens and leadership team look at them like animals. They don't care if they live or die. But you know your team, you know your COs, you know your guards, and you know, like that doesn't make sense to me. Even if you don't care about the well being of this, you know, thousand people that are in your care, which is just so fucked up to begin with, at least you should care about the people that you work with that are supposed to have your back, that is, it's your team, that you're all protecting each other. To not even care about that is, way fucked up that means you're just downright evil yeah you know so it it also i mean of course there's bureaucracy as well of just like well it's probably one of those situations like i don't know if you've finished mind hunter season two where it's like well we need to get these flyers printed well i need a job number a ticket number an approval i need five signatures it also could have been that where it's like yes you need the lights to be repaired which seems like the most simple thing ever but there could have been all this stupid red tape and bullshit to go through where you have to get it approved. And maybe that could have been holding it back. And still, there's no excuse for that. There should be, even if that bureaucracy existed, some sort of override or priority where you're like, yeah, this goes straight to the warden yeah, because people's lives are in danger. And this is important, you know? So, so many people drop the ball on top of just being unbelievably inhumane to these prisoners. It is also just negligence, corruption, so many layers of fucked upness. And yeah. again, just one of the reasons why it's important to explore this because we're looking at jailhouse murders from different lenses, from different perspectives. And this one is a, a terrible slash great example of, yeah. of awful corruption in the it prison is, system. It is a good example. Yeah. So on that note, <laughs> so we will be back next week with part two. So, um, yeah, in the meantime, if you want to read more about these, there's the attorney general report on it that I'm going to put in the link for the show notes. There's also another, um, I think it's called Unresolved podcast, did a, like a huge three part series on it and a bunch of articles that you can read in the show notes. So if you can't wait till next time when we finish this, definitely check those out. And if you want to hear more from us in the meantime, before next episode, you can check out our Patreon where we've got some bonus content and you can hear additional episodes from us. And with that said, we want to say thank you to Michelle, Jennifer and Ellen that are new patrons on our Patreon. Thank you, ladies. If you want to join our Patreon, oh, it's yeah. patreon.com slash Murder Dictionary Podcast. We're also on social media. Murder Dictionary Podcast on every platform. Yeah, whatever come it be. chat with us on Instagram yeah. and Twitter and Facebook. We're come active in, in our group. Come get in the group. And this is Courtney talking. If um, <laughs> People didn't know that by you your, your been, volume. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever been to this prison or if you've like seen the outside or something, if you can post some pictures of how it is now or something, I personally would love that. I would love to see. 
So if you've been there to film, if you've got me, anyway, if you've got any some. sweet New Mexico insight, some of go. my family is from Bernalillo, so I know a little bit about this area. But definitely, we're not the only ones that can contribute to our social media. Oh, so no, definitely please. share with us if you've got insight on what's going on in this area, what the prison's like, or if you've got some family members that went through the system or worked it there. Or, yeah, this is this is so. I want to hear it. I want to hear it all. Yeah. All the time. Anything we do, please. It's Feel one thing when you just group. see the attorney general report and it's so, you know, just dry, black and white. There's no life to it. But to hear people's personal stories of yes. what they know and what they've experienced, we are always down to hear that. So definitely share those if you're on our social media. And if you're not on there, come talk with us. Get on there. Come hang out. What are you doing with your life? Posting pictures of a penitentiary on the <laughs> Facebook group. <laughs> okay, everybody. We'll see you shortly. So, yeah. Have a good week. We'll see you next time. And bye. Bye. Hi, I'm Brianna. And I'm Courtney. From Crime Screen Podcast. Where every week we talk about movies, TV shows, and docuseries based on true crimes. We discuss all the bingeable and unforgettable true crime that we're all watching on our screens at home. Like Making a Murderer. Mommy Dead and Dearest, or Dear Zachary. So if you're like us and have the problem of scaring off people at parties with serial killer facts and true crime stories, or you just try to talk about whatever you watched and get horrified looks from coworkers and even hear exasperated significant other, then we are your new friends to discuss all the true crime with. Follow Crime Screen Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay updated. And subscribe to Crime Screen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever else you listen to podcasts.